volume is something that we see missing in episodes of profound anaphylaxis. So you can be giving five litres of fluid to an otherwise healthy patient having an episode of profound anaphylaxis, and that's often not in the mindset of an ethetist under those circumstances. And no matter how hard the heart's working, if there's no volume inside, that hypotension will persist and perfusion will be poor. Welcome to the Australian Anesthesia Podcast and the third and final instalment of my conversation with Dr. Richard Scalaro, the immediate past chair of ANZAG, the Australian New Zealand Anesthetic Allergy Group. I'm your host, Dr. Susie Nui from the Australian Society of Anesthetists, otherwise known as the ASA. Before I introduce this episode, I want to mention that we, the ASA, will be hosting a webinar in March, so in the next month, with Dr. Ben McKenzie. Ben is someone I have known for a long time who tragically lost his teenage son to anaphylaxis. We talk about it in episode 78 of this podcast. And we also talk about how this terrible event has inspired Ben to undertake a PhD. So if you want to hear more about what Ben has learned so far about severe anaphylaxis, then ASA members, keep an eye out on your emails or head over to the events page on the ASA website to register. At the time of recording this podcast, you do need to be a member of the ASA to register. As I said, this is part three of my conversation with Richard. In the first part of this conversation, we talk about the nuances of anaphylaxis testing, such as the expected false positives that occur with morphine. In the second instalment, we took a deeper dive into the therapeutic guidelines advice on penicillin and cephalosporin cross-reactivity. In this episode, Richard and I chat about some of the myths that we have heard when it comes to the management of anaphylaxis. We also share some updates for those of us practicing in Australia and New Zealand in terms of systemic improvements and what we might see on the horizon. All right, enough from me. Let's get into it. So we know that anaphylaxis occurs in about 1 in 10,000 anaesthetics. Could you just remind me of the breakdown in terms of causative agents? So neuromuscular blocking agents are the most common cause overall, causing about 40% of all test positive anaphylaxis cases and about 30% are due to kefazolin and then the other agents involved are chlorhexidine, patent blue and sigamidex and they cover about 85% of all positive test results that we get. So amongst those neuromuscular blocking agents, rocuronin would be the most common, mm-hmm. causing 26% of all our test positives and 14% is a combination of the other agents. Okay. So that being sucks, VEC and cisatricurium. Okay. I'm glad we're talking about neuromuscular blocking agents because the big news this year in terms of anaphylaxis was the TJ announcement on folcadine. Yes. So I assume that you were behind some of the advocacy for that, or ANZAG was. So well done. ANZAG was behind that, and ANZAG's been involved heavily with that in discussions with ANSCA and the TGA dating back close to a decade now, trying to get falcadine removed from sale in Australia due to its risk of producing anaphylaxis to neuromuscular blocking agents. That work originally was first investigated by Fisher and Baldo in Australia, and then further work was done by Floor Varg and Johansson in Norway and Sweden in the early 2000s, which led to the removal of Tuxi, which was a falcadine-containing medication in Norway in 2007. And that was shown that over the next three to four years that the incidence of neuromuscular blocking anaphylaxis decreased associated with that removal of of Tuxi. Interesting. And there's been long discussion about whether there's been enough evidence. And recently, Professor Mertes was the lead of a paper called the Alpha paper, which delivered the result that falconine was associated with neuromuscular blocking anaphylaxis. And the European Medicines Agency decided to remove falconine from the European market. And then Britain followed and Australia followed through the TGA. 
I must say also that the group in Perth, led by Paul Sedley, has mm. been instrumental in that as well. They've authored mm. a paper associated falcadine consumption with increased risk of neuromuscular blocking anaphylaxis as well. Mm, there's been some good work on it. Yes. And congratulations as well for your advocacy on that and well, Anzag's advocacy on it. I, I want to come back to the TGA determination or decision. Yes. Which was the 12 month thing. Yes. So I get that the 12 months, and please correct me if I'm wrong, probably comes from that paper from Mertes and yep. the European Medicines Agency. But we know from the Norway study that it was actually a decline over three to four years. Yes. You know, is that an arbitrary line in the sand? Should we be looking for any history of falcadine use in the last three or four years? Yes, that's a good question. And obviously the one year came from both the Alpha paper and the paper by Sadler. They looked at patients consuming falcadine within that last year. So that's the only time period the European Medicine Agency could deliver an answer for. As you suggested, the work in Scandinavia suggested that anaphylaxis to neuromuscular blocking agents fell over a four-year period. But we're not sure whether that is because patients continue to use falcadine during that period of time. So mm -hmm. it was a product that was available everywhere in Norway, apparently, and patients mm -hmm. would have held on to that, so may have continued to consume falcadine containing medications for some time afterwards. But the only evidence we've got would suggest that, yes, falcadine may be a trigger for neuromuscular blocking anaphylaxis up to three years after mm -hmm. consumption. Yeah, so 12 months is certainly not an absolute cutoff. So the TGA has advised that it's up to health practitioners. Yes, to seek that history, yes. specifically anaesthetists, we need to be asking, have you used falcadine in the last 12 months? I think it was the UK that hasn't recommended that. What are your thoughts? Preoperative consultations are already busy enough. Is this something it's really important we should be asking about if we are planning to use a neuromuscular blocker? So we're currently in discussions. So when I say we, as part of the perioperative allergy subcommittee, we're in discussions with the safety and quality committee with regards to whether it's appropriate to ask patients about falcadine consumption. We've just looked into the positive predictive value of that question and it's probably less than 1%, the positive predictive okay. value. So okay. yes, falcadine is associated with increased risk of anaphylaxis, but it still only happens relatively rarely. And yep. a concern is whether fellows will not give a neuromuscular blocking agent in a situation where it, it's very appropriate to do so because of concerns about anaphylaxis being raised by falcadine. Yeah. So it's fairly nuanced as to what you should be doing. And I don't want to preempt an exact answer today because I want the perioperative allergy subcommittee and the safety and quality committee to answer those questions specifically. Yep. You should always be aware of the best way to manage anaphylaxis and you should be up to date with your guidelines. True. And if you know that the patients consume falconine, there may be some increased risk of anaphylaxis and you need to be aware of that prior mm. to giving your anaesthetic. Is yeah. that enough of an I, answer for you? That's a great answer. <laughs> I didn't mean it to sound like a challenging question. No, no. It's, yeah. When I saw the TGA recommendation, I thought, oh, Jesus, this is another question that I need to remember to ask, given that a lot of my anaesthetics are spont vent GAs and I'm not necessarily planning to paralyse people anyway. But yeah, that positive predictive value is low. And as you said, the mm. peri... The UK Perioperative Allergy Network. I've said that it, it's not a question to be asked, but in <laughs> Europe and particularly in France, they're still being advised that they need to ask that question. Because I had a quick look at the medicines that do contain falcadine that have now been recalled. Yes. And a lot of them will have the same names as their non falcadine yes. So it's really hard to even say to a patient, did you use XYZ cough medicine, yep. do you remember, did it contain falcadine or did yep. you use the falcadine free version? And that's, that's, yes, like, I think there's going to be recall bias in there at least. I would struggle to remember that information. So when we're investigating an episode of anaphylaxis, we ask about falcadine exposure and it's mm -hmm. very difficult for patients to remember. It's very interesting though. There was a spike associated with the TGA recall where patients suddenly said, oh, I've just had one of those medicines. Do you think that could have been involved in my <laughs> episode of anaphylaxis? And suddenly patients were aware that falcadine oh, was a problem. 
But oh. prior to that time, when we asked about falcadine exposures, patients were said, oh, yeah, I've used a cough suppression. Which one have you used? Yeah, I'm not really sure. And it becomes very difficult. And there's 60 approximately medications that contain falcadine. And to go through that enormous list is just not practical. Yeah, agreed. Could we now just do a bit of a rapid fire? Let's tackle some of the myths and common questions that people are posing about anaphylaxis. Yep. So one is, if it wasn't treated with adrenaline, it couldn't have been anaphylaxis. What's your thought there? It's not completely mm-hmm. true. We do have patients that have anaphylaxis, which are managed to be treated with other agents and don't require adrenaline at any stage during the treatment, but definitely had anaphylaxis. So I think it's appropriate that you, as a anaesthetist, believe that it's an episode of anaphylaxis that you should do the appropriate investigations at the time, which include performing a triptase, which will help us, and then referring that patient to a person who investigates perioperative anaphylaxis. If that person who investigates perioperative anaphylaxis gives you reasons as to why they don't believe it was an episode of anaphylaxis, and they write your letter back and tell you that they don't think that's a likely anaphylaxis, then that's appropriate. But they may feel under the circumstances that patient requires investigation. So it's not black and white. There's various Mm -hmm. shades of grey. So just because you didn't give adrenaline doesn't mean it was an episode of anaphylaxis. And most grade two reactions probably don't end up getting adrenaline. Mm. That's true, especially the severe bronchospasms without any hemodynamic compromise. Yes, and it's interesting, anaesthetists rarely call on adrenaline to treat profound bronchospasm, although it's a very good agent for treating profound bronchospasm. It's very common in the US to treat asthma and bronchospasm with adrenaline. Yeah. When I worked with a lot of US doctors, yeah. that's what they reached for. So what about the thought that if it didn't occur immediately, that it couldn't be anaphylaxis? Okay, so I guess it depends which route you're delivering the drug via. The intravenous route, the absolute cutoff we typically use is two hours. That should include 96 to 97% of all episodes of anaphylaxis. A lot of places will use one hour. So if any agents Mm -hmm. given within that one hour would be looked at as the possible causative agents. So that's intravenous agents. Mm -hmm. But if you give a drug intrathecally or subcutaneously or intramuscularly or orally, that may extend Mm -hmm. out to six hours. Okay. So it very much depends on the route of administration. And would that include uh, chlorhexidine at skin prep? So we think it's unlikely that chlorhexidine causes systemic anaphylaxis if it's just put on unbroken skin and allowed to dry. Mm -hmm. People can have a contact dermatitis associated with that, obviously, but it's Mm -hmm. unlikely to produce anaphylaxis unless it comes in contact with broken skin or a mucous membrane. And then under those circumstances, it's essentially giving it via the vascular route It's going to have a a little bit more slow uptake, but Mm -hmm. we think it's more like the IV route. And I think most of us now would investigate any episodes of perioperative anaphylaxis. We always test for chlorhexidine just because it's such Mm -hmm. a ubiquitous agent in the perioperative environment. Another myth or something I want to tackle is people might have had two, three, four previous anaesthetics and maybe had that medication maybe all of those times, some of those times. Can you develop anaphylaxis if you've had at least more than one prior exposure? So the answer is definitely yes. And as we know, the teaching has always been you've got to be exposed to that agent before for you to develop anaphylaxis. So your body has had to be exposed to that. Your body has developed an immune response, developed a memory to that allergen, and then on re-exposure, you develop anaphylaxis. And that won't necessarily happen on your second exposure, third exposure, fourth exposure. It might only happen on your fifth exposure to that agent. That's the way your immune system has responded to that allergen. The bigger question is why do people have anaphylaxis on their first exposure to an Mm -hmm. agent? So they've never been given rocuronium. This is their first anaesthetic ever. Why have they developed anaphylaxis to rocuronium? And obviously that work with falcadine suggest that there's things in the environment that people are exposed to that can cause anaphylaxis to something different. And there are other things in the environment, such as cleaning solutions and cosmetics and food products, etc., that people Mm -hmm. are exposed to all the time that may lead to patients developing anaphylaxis to an agent they've never been exposed to before. 
And that's why one of the high-risk occupational groups, I think, is hairdressers, isn't it? There's some thought about hair dyes or yeah, something? Yeah, some of the hair dyes, hair cleaning products as well. That yeah. evidence is pretty small evidence, but mm-hmm. yes. Are there any common myths that I am missing? What do you get asked about often? No, those are the pretty common things, but particularly the fact that they've had this agent multiple times before, surely it couldn't be this agent and it's, no, this time it is that agent. So yeah, that's the most common thing. Thank you. (laughs) Is there anything else that you want to mention about anaphylaxis or allergies in anaesthetics? Other thing I want to talk about particularly is, is fluid resuscitation in profound anaphylaxis. And I think the Australian Fellowship has very much got on board with giving adrenaline and appropriate doses of adrenaline in anaphylaxis. But we need to remember that anaphylaxis results in the loss of intravascular volume. And no matter how hard the heart's working, if there's no volume inside, that hypotension will persist and perfusion will be poor. And it's important that in episodes of grade three and grade four anaphylaxis that you're using appropriate amounts of volume. And volume is something that we see missing in episodes of profound anaphylaxis. Not all the time, but it's one of the more common things to be missing. And if you've got an episode of profound anaphylaxis, you need to look at those cards and remind yourself how much volume you should be giving because the amount of volume involved is substantial. Yeah, I agree. And that's a really good point. I've been to a few resuscitations where I think we were underdoing the volume. So that's a really good point. I think it was up to 50 mils per kilo or something. Yeah, your initial but, and repeated. Pulse. So yes. you can be giving five litres of fluid to an otherwise healthy patient having an episode of profound anaphylaxis. And that's often not in the mindset of anaesthetists under those circumstances. Yeah, good point. And then using transthoracic echocardiography, not necessarily by yourself, but someone skilled. You can always ask Mm. a cardiologist to come in and help you. If you've got an episode of profound anaphylaxis that's not responding to treatment, to have a look at what your filling pressures are like and what your myocardium is doing. And remembering, obviously, that anaphylaxis is only one cause of profound hypotension and cardiac arrest. And we need to make sure under those circumstances, we're not missing anything else. That's true. And often the case fluid and adrenaline do help in those situations. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, thank you. Is there anything else that you want to mention? I th- think the work we want to do with ANZAG now is we've really been keen on developing a database for perioperative anaphylaxis in Australia. As an organisation, we found it difficult due to the various jurisdictions around us, Australia mm. and various ethics committees making it somewhat difficult to obtain that and we haven't Mm. been able to develop a database this time although it's been on our list of aims since we started in 2010. These things take time. (laughs) There looks like there's some movement on that space and we would love to develop a national database on perioperative Mm. allergy to answer some of those questions like what are the most common agents? What agents are causing type 3 and 4 anaphylaxis more commonly than the other agents? Mm. How often are we finding patients testing positive with type 3 and type 4 as opposed to type 2 and type 1? What sort of doses of adrenaline are appropriate for these patients? And having a database will very much help with that. Allergy is very much a geographical issue. Yeah, interesting. Patients with allergy to various agents is much more likely in some countries than others, such as like France and Australia have quite high neuromuscular blocking agent anaphylaxis, whereas Mm -hmm. the United States and some Scandinavian countries have quite low numbers. So it's important that we get our own numbers. And we're also looking at the development of what we would call anaphylaxis leads. Oh, yeah, like airway leads. Yeah, nice. And we're looking for people to be champions of anaphylaxis in organisations and great idea build communication between small organisations and larger organisations and ensure that patients who are having episodes of anaphylaxis get referred appropriately yep. and then that information after testing is, is distributed appropriately to the patient, the hospital yes. where the event occurred and the health facility itself and GPs. Oh, that's great. I I had a patient recently, like I was in the last few weeks, and when we went to pull out the Anzac cards, half of them weren't there and they were the old set. Yes. And and that's why I know the trip taste times now. Yes. Uh, and then I was in another hospital and we just had a run. We seemed to have an anaphylaxis-like event every 
week for about three or four weeks. It just came in this big burst as they tend to do. And again, we were using, in retrospect, because I then looked up the new cards when it happened to me, was we were using the old cards because there was this great confusion over the adrenaline dose. Yes. And how often you give it and when do you put the outline in and people were like, put the outline in first, then give the adrenaline. And actually, it's, when you look at the new cards, it's actually really clear. Yes. Having someone to keep updating and, and knowing when the new yes. ones come out and, you know, that's a great idea. And providing education about anaphylaxis, yes, and making sure the resources are appropriate in their environment. Yeah. The other thing that commonly happens with the anaphylaxis management cards is people use the paediatric anaphylaxis management card for adult populations. So mm -hmm. the card's been changed in the third edition, the most recent edition, to try to make that less likely to happen. Yeah. yeah. And I would say treatment always goes ahead of monitoring. Yes. Yes. That's what I was saying. Just finger on the pulse <laughs> and just keep giving adrenaline until you can feel the pulse come yes, back. Like, exactly. Like <laughs> old school. Get the resources in to put the art line in when you've got those resources, when you can still yeah, maintain yeah. treatment appropriately. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Exactly. The anaphylaxis cards are on the ANSCA website and they direct you through the ANSAG website as well. Excellent. And also directing people to the anaphylaxis emergency response module. That's been updated now since the new cards have been developed. Ah, okay. So it was offline for a period of time while the cards were being developed. So that's now online again as an online resource, please. Cool. Too easy. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Not that I can think of at the moment, Susie. <laughs> okay, you let me know. You let me know. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's so educational. You learn anaphylaxis for your part two. You then, unfortunately, manage more anaphylaxis than you want to during your career. Yep. But I think you always still want to make sure that you're up to date because it is such a critical thing yep. in anaesthetics to, to maintain currency with. Thank you very much. Okay, you take care. Thanks, Susie. Well, I hope you enjoyed this series on anaphylaxis and found them as valuable as I have. Richard mentioned lots of resources there. If you haven't already, then I encourage you to check out the ANSAG website. There you will find the latest edition of the anaphylaxis management cards. For now, until the anaphylaxis database is up and running, I encourage you to report any incidents of anaphylaxis as well as possible anaphylaxis episodes to WebAirs. If you are not sure what WebAirs is, then I invite you to listen to episode 54, that's episode 54, where I chat with Professor Martin Culwick, who was at the time the medical director. I mention that because you'll find a link to WebAirs from the ANSAG website. Finally, the emergency response module on anaphylaxis has been updated. I have just completed it and can recommend it highly. You'll find it on the college website or the ANZAG website. You do need to be a member to access it. So that wraps up our educational series on anaphylaxis. Don't forget to include listening to the podcast. Doesn't have to be this episode. It can be any episode in your CPD portfolio. Did I cover all your questions on anaphylaxis? If not, then please let me know. What did I miss? What else would you like to know? The best email to contact me is podcast at asa.org.au. Until the next episode, which, if all goes to plan, is going to be a very special episode, I hope you are staying safe and well out there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Australian Anesthesia Podcast, which can be found on all the major podcast hosting platforms, as well as YouTube. This podcast is produced by the Australian Society of Anaesthetists and hosted by Dr. Susie Newt with music created by Dr. Mark Seuss. The ASA was formed in 1934 and our vision is for every anaesthetist in Australia to be at their best, providing the highest quality anaesthesia and perioperative care through excellent technical and non-technical skills. We also hope that this means that you are functioning at your best when you're away from work. In this podcast, we have conversations that seek to inform, challenge and inspire you to keep you performing at your best. Members of the ASA can access full versions of all episodes by logging into the ASA website at asa.org.au. If you are listening on your favourite podcast app, then make sure you look at the episode notes for the direct link to the podcast on the ASA website. Also, feel free to follow or subscribe so that you can receive the latest episodes as we do publish regularly. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to email us on podcast at asa.org.au. Thank you for your time and we hope you enjoyed listening. Listening.